Part 1 You will hear a woman being interviewed by a market researcher in a health club about her membership of the club. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 5. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 5. Oh, excuse me. I wonder if you'd have the time to take part in some market research. Um, what's it about? About this club and your experiences and opinions about being a member. It'll take less than five minutes. Oh, OK then, as long as it's quick. <laughs> Can I start by taking your name? It's Selina Thompson. Is that T-H-O-M-P-S-O-N? Yes. Okay. Great, thanks. And what do you do for a living? Well, I'm an accountant, but I'm between jobs at the moment. I understand, but that's the job I'll put down on the form. And would you mind my asking which age group you fall into? Below 30, 31 to 50, and above? Over 50, <laughs> I think we can safely say. <laughs> <laughs> Great, thanks. And which type of membership do you have? Sorry, I'm not sure what you mean. Do you mean how long... Of no, is it a single person membership? Oh, right, no, it's a family membership. <laughs> thanks. And... How long have you been a member? Oh, let me see. Uh, I was certainly here five years ago, and it was probably two to three years more than that. Mm -hmm. Shall I put down eight? Oh, I remember now. It's nine, definitely. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no problem. I've got that. And the last question in this first part is, what brought you to the club? Uh, sorry? Uh, how did you find out about the club? Do you see any ads? Well, I, I did, actually. But I have to say, I wasn't really attracted to the club because of that. It was through word of mouth. So you were recommended by a friend? <laughs> actually, my doctor. Oh. I'd been suffering from high blood pressure, and he said the club was very supportive of people with that condition, so I signed up. Mm, great, thanks. Before you hear the rest of the conversation... You have some time to look at questions 6 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 6 to 10. Now, for the second part of the form, I want to ask a bit more about your experience of the club. Sure. Uh, how often would you say you use the club? <sighs> it varies enormously, depending on how busy I am. Mm, of course. But on average, per month? I'd say it averages out at twice a week. OK, so eight on average. Yeah, and four of those are aqua aerobics classes. That leads me to the next question. Would you say the swimming pool is the facility you make most use of? Fair to say that, yep. Right, thanks. And are there any facilities you don't use? Hmm. 
One area I realise I've never used is the tennis courts. Mm. And there's one simple reason for that. You don't play tennis? <laughs> Actually, I'm not bad at it. Oh. It's that I'm not happy having to pay extra for that privilege. Oh, right. I've made a note of that. Thanks. Mm. <clears throat> now, in the last section, are there any suggestions or recommendations you have for improvements to the club? Uh, only about health and fitness. Anything at all? Well, I'd like to see more social events. Oh. It isn't just a question of getting together for games or classes, but other things, you know. Yes, yeah, sure. And another thing that I was thinking when I had my yoga class in the gym last night, we were all sweltering in the heat, uh, was that I think they should put in, or, you know... Uh, Air conditioning. Uh, that's exactly what I mean. Mm. The rooms are really light and well designed, but they do need proper installations. Sure. Well, I've made a note of that. Good. So, is there anything else you'd like to suggest? Uh, about quality of service, for example? Oh, everyone's very nice here. They couldn't be more friendly and helpful. Oh, but I tell you what... It's a shame the restaurant isn't open in the evening on Saturday. And Sunday as well, for that matter. Oh. So the club should... Yeah, open it later on those days. OK. Well, thank you very much. That's <laughs> all the questions I have. That is the end of part one. You now have one minute to check your answers to part one. Section 2. You'll hear a talk by a security worker from Sydney Airport who is introducing the day-to-day -day operations of the Australian Quarantine Service. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 17. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 17. Hi everyone and welcome to Sydney Airport. Today I'll be giving you the inside information on the day-to-day -day operations of the Australian Quarantine Service here. We hope to provide you with a better understanding of why such heavy security regulations are necessary by educating you on how we operate and why we do the things we do. We're not here to try to persuade you to fly through Sydney Airport, though we hope you'll find your experience relatively stress-free and comfortable. First things first, our personnel. Can anyone guess how many people work at Sydney Airport? We have 200 alone working in Terminal 2, so can you guess how many in the whole airport? I heard someone say 360. That's getting closer. What? Did someone say 2,000? That's way too high. Sydney Airport actually employs 440 people. A lot, right? And about half of those employees work in security-related matters. Moving on to our not-so-human employees, let's come and see our favourite pooch, Milton. Milton is our best drug-sniffing dog on the force. He's friendly to most people. You can even come pet him at the end of our tour. Burnouts? Beware, though. He'll find everything. Notice that even though there are so many of us around him, Milton stays quite calm. This is the precise reason he was chosen for the job. Dogs that are chosen are not predisposed to sniff out different narcotics, 
That's something we teach them already. So here's a part of the airport most people never notice: the cargo transport terminal. This is where packages are shipped to and from. Normally, we ship around 4,400 packages per month. In this airport alone, over 52,000 packages were shipped in and out over the past year. We ship to and from 170 different countries. Not bad, eh? Probably it will go up to over 72,000 packages this year. And despite over 100 flights in and out of here daily, the number of lost or delayed packages is impressively low. If you send your package through here, rest assured, we'll get it where it's going. Let's move on to the area most of us are familiar with: the passenger terminals. In order to be allowed into this area, you must pass through security with your ticket, and if you're traveling internationally, your passport. If you're traveling domestically, you just need a legal form of ID. If you don't have those, you will not be allowed to pass through security and board your flight. During the security scan, your carry-on items will be checked for dangerous items such as weapons, sharp objects, and liquids that exceed our specified limit. If you attempt to pass any of the prohibited items on this list posted at the entrance, you are still allowed to board the plane, but you'll be given a warning, and your item will be confiscated. Don't worry, we will not arrest you for having too much shampoo in your bag or anything like that. We also search your carry-ons and parcels for any perishable items. We prohibit the transportation of local vegetation and prohibit parcels containing any insects in them. You may or may not have learned about this in biology class, but when some plants are introduced to a new environment, they spread wildly and wipe out the current species around it. It is important to control the introduction of new plants into an ecosystem, so we must prohibit the transport of any fertile seeds. So what happens to parcels containing possibly suspicious items? It's of course something we do not take lightly here. If an object passes through the scanner that appears suspicious in any way, it is separated out for manual search by a member of our trained security personnel. If an illegal plant or simple sharp object like a pocket knife is found, it is simply disposed of in our biohazard waste containers. And the package itself is returned to the sender, or passenger, if it is for a passenger flight. More serious weapons are reported to higher authorities for investigation. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 18 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 18 to 20. As far as parcel security, the material of the parcel is important. For shipped goods, the most common material used and the most widely accepted is paper. Make sure it is packed sturdy enough with no rips or tears. We've definitely had packages rip open before due to haphazard packing. A more common problem, though, is the package labels. When an item does not make it to the right place, this is the most common reason. The label may not be in the right place or marked clearly enough. If you're receiving any items from abroad that must be declared, please remember our guidelines in order to ensure the timely delivery of your item. Make sure it is packed correctly, and we ask that you notify customs between two and ten days within the item's scheduled arrival date. Okay, before we move on, are there any questions? That is the end of section two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Section three. You will hear a librarian called Adam Smith 
talking to the students about how to use the facilities in the library. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 26. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 26. Welcome. Please come in and gather over here around the tables. My name is Adam Smith and I'm the librarian here. I'll show you around today and explain how to use these facilities. Hopefully when I'm done with it you'll know the ropes and please feel free to let me know of any questions or concerns that you may have. Now we're at the gate of the library. Upon entering into the door, you'll find that the restrooms are on your left-hand side, and opposite them is a photocopy room. Many of you are wondering about the check-in and check-out process. What you have to do is go to the circulation desk, which is to the east of the photocopy room. The reading room is a really large area in the center of the library, just to the north of the circulation desk. I'm sure you won't miss it. If you're here to do research, this is where you should bring books to look through. However, if you're here to do any group projects or other interactive activities, I advise you to use one of the study rooms, which are just to the east of the reading room. Moving on to the southeast corner, we have the periodical section, just next to the study rooms. We have a collection of different newspapers and magazines in this section. You can get last week's weather reports, or all the top stories five years ago. Our periodicals can be traced back 20 years to the time when our school library was built. Ah, our first question, yes. Can we check out magazines from the library? I'm sorry, but you cannot take any periodicals out of the library. You're welcome to read them for as long as you want while you're here, but you cannot check them out. I wonder if there is any place where we can get some food in the library. Do we have a store here? Of course. The Food Service Center is just meters away from the study rooms. It's on the northeast corner as you look at the map. The Food Service Center offers different kinds of snacks, though it's not big. Well, moving on along to the west, you will find the Video Resource Center on your right hand. We have educational videos and documentaries, as well as major motion pictures. We ask that you pay attention to the tag on the video that you pick up, as many of our documentaries are for on-site viewing only and may not be taken out of the library. To the west of the Video Resource Center is our satellite TV station. Here we stream the news from Channel 19 for most of the day. How many channels does it have? <laughs> it does have nearly 200 channels, but we generally will give top priority to channels with some big events, like presidential addresses or other breaking news. During the coverage of the presidential debate, students will take a break from studying and flock to watch it. Last, but perhaps most important, is the inquiry desk. It's just on the left-hand side when you walk into the library, so it's impossible to miss it. If you have any questions about how to use equipment or where to find something, come and ask the assistant. Don't be shy, because that's what they're here for. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 27 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 27 to 30. 
Speaking of questions, one of the questions we get asked is how to actually check out a book once a student has picked one out. If it's a fiction or non-fiction book, look for the pink and yellow checkout card inside the back cover of the book. You can also find information about the book on these cards, including its publishing date, genre, ISBN, and a log of dates it's been checked out before. Present this card to me or any library assistant, and we'll stamp it, and then the book can be kept for three weeks. You can find general information on a field of study by using one of our subject guides. We have them on paper here, but any of our computers will allow you to search within fields as well. What if the library doesn't have a resource we're looking for? Great question. I'm going to address that. Our library is a network with a number of other universities in the area. So if there is something you're looking for and it's available somewhere in the area, we'll be able to get it for you. However, there are universities which are not part of the network, so we do not share resources with them. If you want more information about the library and its resources, you'll find it in a labeled blue folder on my desk in the inquiry section. Okay, so that's a lot of information all at once, and I don't expect you to remember it all. The most important thing is please be respectful of the staff, and if you need help with anything at all, come and ask me or one of the assistants. All right, any questions? That is the end of section three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Section 4. You will hear a lecture about Crocodilus niloticus and its living habits. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Good morning. Today we will continue our study of Crocodilus niloticus by talking about its living habits. We've already discussed the evolutionary attributes that set it apart from its crocodile relatives. Does everyone remember that? Yes, it has an extremely narrow snout and three or four rows of protective scales on its back as compared to two rows on other members of the Crocodilus genus. Let's take a look at how these carnivorous man-eaters live, where they live, and finally, whether they really deserve their vicious reputation. To start, I'd like to address a great question posed to me by a student during yesterday's office hours. We talked about the distribution of crocodiles in Africa and saw that they are highly concentrated in the south and west of the continent. This student noticed that on the map displaying the distribution of crocodiles across Africa, there were no crocodiles in the northern region and found no mention in the literature of the existence of crocodiles in the north of Africa. Why might there be no crocodiles in North Africa? Let's save this question for later in the lecture. To find out more about the social habits of the African crocodile, one researcher named Tara Shine of the University of Ulster in Northern Ireland conducted a survey of the wetlands in Mauritania and received reports of 46 crocodiles living in one group, or float as we say when referring to crocodiles, though the usual number is a little less than half of that. In general, crocodiles are more highly concentrated in wet subtropical environments near bodies of water and rich vegetation. While South American crocodiles thrive in cool rainforests, 
the African crocodile is more equipped for heat. Though they can survive at the hot temperatures found in some deserts, they are not equipped to handle dry climates and thus cannot survive in places like the Sahara Desert of North Africa. As cold-blooded animals, crocodiles' core temperatures fluctuate from their average of 38 degrees Celsius as external conditions change. Thus, they need to avoid extreme temperatures. Others live an underwater life, keeping a body temperature close to that of the water. As their own unique method of regulating their body temperatures, some African crocodiles have made dens by digging holes in the ground to provide themselves with a cool, dark place to retreat from the hot African sun. Speaking of the hot African sun, let's go back to the question asked at the beginning of the lecture. We know that there used to be crocodiles in northern Africa, yet today there are none. What are some possible explanations for this? Some students have suggested that the African crocodile has evolved from a desert creature into a wetland creature, thus causing them to migrate south for more appropriate conditions. Others presume that the crocodile was hunted out of northern Africa by a fiercer predator. While these are intelligent guesses, the real story is a little bit different. The key to this migration is that the Sahara Desert did not always cover the north of Africa. About 8,000 years ago, the land was fertile wetlands, perfect for breeding crocodiles. Over time, though, the area dried out and the wetland slowly turned to desert, leading the African crocodile to migrate south to the marshlands they call home today. Some crocodiles did, however, adapt to living in dry conditions. In Mauritania, some crocodiles have learned to survive in an area where they can go up to eight months with no water by spending the driest of times in what's called a torpor or short period of hibernation. To utilize every bit of rainfall, these desert crocodiles dig underground caves that collect runoff, thus staying cool and hydrated. During the mating period in November and December, males attract females to their viciously protected territory through a number of behaviours that range from snapping their jaws all the way to sending infrasonic pulses through the water. Afterwards, the female digs a hole up to 60 centimetres in depth to store the eggs for an 80-day incubation period. The female protects these eggs during the period and sometimes even helps crack the eggs with her snout at the end. These teeth-gnashing carnivores are softer than we think. Although these vicious creatures have attacked humans on a few occasions, the residents are not afraid of them. In fact, they show a great deal of reverence towards these wondrous creatures. Some say that crocodiles bring water to their habitat, so if they leave, they will bring the water with them. Obviously this is not true, but it demonstrates the admiration the inhabiting people have for crocodiles. Generally, crocodiles do not predate on humans. They attack when humans populate the crocodile's habitat, instilling fear and uneasiness in the crocs. Like any other species, crocodiles are known to attack when feeling fear. There's still a lot more to be discovered about the African crocodile. Researchers want to know more about the population size how many crocodiles inhabit Africa in all, how they form separate floats, etc. There is still also much to learn about migration patterns and relations to other populations of crocodiles now found in other parts of the world. Next time, we'll examine a few specific case studies of crocodile populations in southern Africa. That is the end of Section 4. You now have half a minute to check your answers.